Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. With me today is Kirsten Howes. She is the owner, managing lawyer, attorney of the Absolute Trust Council. Hope I got that right because I had to do it off the top of my head. She's going to discuss with us what being a trustee and or beneficiary means and what we need to know to manage all that paperwork that happens after our loved ones pass away. So thank you very much for joining me. I look forward to learning some stuff that I probably should have known five years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. And thank you for having me here today. I'm sure you handled your trust administrations beautifully, but, um, you know, it does, it, it does help to know people. I had a conversation yesterday, I believe, where we, I said, you know, I'm not a humongous fan of going to the bank, but you know, when you make friends with people in the bank, becoming a power of attorney and having them know you and trust you is much easier if they know you. That's so true. That I, I know I knew people to ask questions of and they helped guide me through. So so you're the friend that's going to guide everybody through today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, so I can, I can, um, talk to you kind of like the overall idea and the overall process, and then we can get into any details that interest you. <laughs> Sounds terrific. <laughs> I did read, um, Kirsten has excellent PDFs that you can download. And I did read through the one that we're discussing today, but She's the lawyer. I am not. Some of that stuff still confuses me when I read it. So I like to hear from people. I like I've read it. Now you're going to talk to us about it. People can read it, listen to this, and hopefully they'll be well armed for the seems like an immense amount of paperwork to deal with. Yeah, it can be. All right. So we are talking um, today about what happens after someone who has a trust in place dies. And if you've ever been involved in that process, it does seem like it's a lot of work and I'm going to tell you it is. So somebody has been named in that document as the trustee. And oftentimes it's a child. That's what happened to you, Jen. You were the trustee after your parents died and it was your job to wrap everything up and follow the trust instructions. And it's when you start out, if you don't have a lot of guidance, it seems like just a tornado of stuff and you have no idea what to do first and how long this is going to take, how long your life is going to be consumed by this. But it is very logical and there is actually a process and it does make sense if, you know, if somebody explains it to you, it's not intuitively (laughs) sensible, but (laughs) that's true. (laughs) it, It really does make sense if you, if you understand it. Um, and as, as you mentioned, we do have, I mean, we have a lot of resources on our website, but the thing you were talking about on absolute trust in our, in our guidebooks is, uh, I think it's guidebook number four. It's all about trust administration. And, and I see it as it's about seven big steps, seven large tasks that have to happen some of them are happening all at the same time. Some of them happen in the beginning and then there's one in the end, that kind of thing. But basically every trust administration has to go through these steps for the most part. That's a general rule. Um, what I So you can get that guidebook on our website. It's free. Just download it. You That helps a lot. And for me to have something in writing in front of me helps my brain. So, so get it, even if you're listening to this and it all makes sense, just get it. Um, What a lot of, so the the first step really is, um, involves a lot of notification. And we find that a lot of trustees, you know, they'll become the trustee because their mom died and they're named in the document. And they, you know, there are certain things, you know, you have to do, you know, you know, you have to get a death certificate. Okay. You know, you've got to stop the credit cards and stuff like that. But a lot of times trustees don't know everything they're supposed to do. And one of the very first things they are supposed to do is they are supposed to give a legal notice 
to all of the other trust beneficiaries and also to the heirs of the person who died. Now, the heirs might not be the same people as the beneficiaries. The heirs are the people who are, you know, legally next of kin. Whether they're in the trust or not, they might have been disinherited. They still are entitled to be noticed. And it's an official notice the trustee has to send out. And really, you got to get that going because it's the only way to protect yourself as trustee from somebody coming down from whoever, who knows where. Out of the woodwork. (laughs) Out of the woodwork. Exactly. You know, five years from now and saying, hey, where's my money? You, you, you've got to, this notice starts a time period for people to come forward. Even if they miss that time period, that's too bad. You, you gave the notice, you're done. So that's like lesson number one. If you're doing this on your own, it's fine. A lot of these things can be done without an attorney, but get started with an attorney. Just, you know, talk to somebody and make sure you don't miss the important steps. So a lot of people don't know there are certain legal notices that have to go out. And that's the most important one is you've got to notify all the beneficiaries and all the heirs. Um, Now I'm wondering if we did all that. (laughs) Well, you know, I mean, in, in a lot of families, it's okay. You you know that nobody's going to come forward. Nobody's going to say, Hey, that trust, that's not the final version. There's, I have this other, you know, nobody's going to crawl forward with some problem. Um, So in a lot of families, that's okay. But why would you take that risk if you could so easily avoid it by just sticking a few pieces of paper in the mail? So um, that's my first piece of advice is just from the beginning, at least talk to a lawyer and make sure you don't miss any of the important things. Um, and then you've got, you know, you've got to um, figure out what all the assets are and get control of them because they were ideally in the trust with your deceased parent as the trustee. Now you've got to change all of that so that you as the trustee are the owner of these assets. So like, you know, real estate, you've got to record a document against the title to that piece of real estate that lets the whole world know that now you're the trustee and now you own that real estate as the trustee and therefore you legally could sell it if that's what you need to do. But you got to get control of all the assets. So you got to go round up all the bank accounts. You got to round up all the investment accounts and get them in your name as the trustee. And those all have to be in the trust originally. Like yeah. we did our trust in 2020. Mm-hmm. So we were between home ownership. So when we bought the house that we just moved into, I know because my husband's a real estate broker. So. I only I only know this because he kept telling me we there was once we closed and finalized and all the whatevers, there was a specific document that he needed to get. And it's not typical. You have to ask for it. I mean, it's it's a standard document, but it's not a standard document just because you buy a home. But it it allowed us to put the new house into our Huge. trust. Right. And if we had not known about that or he, you know, if he did not know about that or we didn't get this form, this house would not be in our trust. That's correct. Yes. So how how would just because I'm curious, and that's the whole point of talking to people. And that's like your you. job. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what so what would have happened, say, you know, we got I mean, we we had to drive out of Yosemite after Christmas with no windshield wipers in the snow, in the <laughs> snowfall and rain. It was very fun. <laughs> sarcasm font inserted here and i mean if our daughter was with us so this is completely irrelevant but if we had not made it home from yosemite and the house was not in the trust because we had just moved in what would they what would she have to do can you put it in the trust retroactively or yes so when you have an estate plan that has a trust in it you also have a will which we 
you know, informally referred to as a pour over will. And what that means is your will, your will and your husband's will both will say, if I die and I own any property, put it in my trust. I'm giving it to my trust. So that's what your will says. So this home that you live in now, if it wasn't in your trust, the will says, put it in the trust. So that part's the easy part. We know what to do. The hard part is how do we do it? Okay. So if you have a dead person owns property, and that would be the case if you and your husband crashed on the way back from Yosemite, you would have two dead people who own this house. That means in order to get it where it's supposed to go, we have to go to probate court. We have to open a probate, even though you know, you set that trust up to avoid probate. It's so important to make sure all your assets are correctly titled. Eventually they'll get where you want them to go. But if it has to, if we have to do a probate anyway, you know, you're spending a lot of money that you were trying to avoid. So there's that it's basically two questions, you know, where does it go and how do we get it there? Two different issues. Um, And we always want to avoid probate. So Yeah, your husband was right. He, as soon as you closed escrow, everything was cool. The lender was cool. Then you turn around and you put it in your trust. Yep, that's what what we did. I mean, it was was within a month or less. It was pretty fast. You can do. It it might have even been in the first two weeks. I'll have to ask him when we're done. (laughs) Yeah, you can do. I mean, you can do it actually on the same day. It doesn't really matter. Um, But you just want to do it. (laughs) Make sure that we. Go well. It was. I think we closed. Then they did renovations, and then we moved in. So now I don't remember when we did it. I just remember that was like I got to get this document for him. He was very, very focused on getting that one piece of paper, and I understood why. And it would be really easy to miss it. You know, obviously, had we not gone through the trust, you know, preparation for ourselves, he might not have been. It might not have been as top of mind and he might not know to ask other clients of his, hey, do we need this document to go into your trust? Because, you know, that starts getting into asking people about their finances and, you know, we that's another whole topic that we are. Right. That, I think that episode is coming out. I can't remember which one of you guys is first, but they're all they're close together. So, <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah, so getting it into your trust, very important. And when you die, the person who becomes your trustee, now it's their job to figure out if we have assets that aren't already in the trust, how are we going to get them in the trust? And I, oh, I, I hate having that conversation with clients when, you know, they come in and they say, my mom died, here's her trust. And I say, oh, okay, we can help you with the trust and we have to do a probate. That's like one of my least favorite conversations. <laughs> I can understand why. So, um, so don't do that. Don't don't do that to your family. Anyway, trustee, now you got to get everything in your name into the trust. You're going to open a bank account in the name of the trust. You got to get a taxpayer ID number in order to do that because you you don't want to use your social security number. You don't want this stuff being reported to the IRS on your social security number. You can't use your dead mom's social security number because that thing is gone now. It's retired. You get a new taxpayer ID number, and that's what you're going to use for your accounts. Gather everything up. You have to get a value on everything. So, um, you know, bank accounts, that's easy. You can figure out what that was worth on the date of death. Investment accounts, also pretty easy. You know, there are ways to get that directly from the investment house. You know, let's say you have an account at Schwab. You just call them up and say, hey, I need you to run the date of death values on all these stocks in my Schwab account. Um, but for real estate, you're going to have to get appraisals. You, you will hire an appraiser and they'll give you date of death values. So you want to, as trustee, have all of those values calculated. Um, and then, you know, you got to pay the debts of the decedent, you pay the creditors, you think sometimes more money comes in as you're doing your job, you know, like they might've prepaid something and they get a refund 
or, you know, they die and they get a refund on, on their health insurance or something, you know, money does come in you got to keep track of all of that and you keep track of everything you spend money on. Um, and there's work, you know, if there's a house, guess what? <laughs> you got to clean that thing out. You can hire people to help you. You don't have to be the one who goes in there every Saturday until it's done, but you're going to have to do that if you want to put it on the market and then, you know, sell the real estate if that's what you're going to do. Um, you just take care of all these things. It's important as a trustee, you know, here's like your overarching thing is even if you're also a beneficiary, you know, if you also are going to get part of this inheritance, your job as trustee is paramount and you are doing what's in the best interest of all of the beneficiaries. Their interests have to come first. So you got to take care of these assets. You know, if it's a house, you got to keep you got to make sure the mortgage keeps getting paid. You got to make sure the life, the homeowner's insurance keeps getting paid, the HOA, whatever. You got to pay the gardener if that's necessary in order to keep things as they yeah. should be. Don't let the yard die if you're going to sell the house. If you're going to sell the house, a dead yard is not a good thing. So those kinds of things, those are expenses of your administration and the trust will pay for them. But you're the one who has to, to do that stuff. You've got to take responsibility and, and make sure everything, you know, goes as it should until you can sell that house if that's the plan. Now, maybe that isn't always the plan. Maybe one of the beneficiaries wants one of the houses or, or maybe the trust says, you know, this beneficiary gets this house. You, you're, one of your most important jobs is follow the trust document do do what it says and follow the law and that's where consulting with an attorney comes in um because yeah, uh, is trust administration does it vary i'm sure it varies somewhat from state to state because you you and i are both in california and you know we could all we could make california jokes all day but it does <laughs> it does it vary widely or just there's just some slight variations or do you know? <laughs> I would say that the basic idea, the basic process is going to be the same because it, as I said, it is a logical process. You got to, obviously, you got to get the assets. You got to figure out what they're worth. You got to pay the taxes. You got to distribute them to the beneficiaries. But the little details, like when I said, you got to send that written notice in the beginning, that's unique to California. Other states probably have something similar, but I'm, I don't even know. I, I'm just um, telling you that the overall process is the same because these are the things that just have to happen. And um, and they're very the trust administration process actually is very similar to the probate process. It's just that mm. we don't have to go to court. We don't have to wait for a judge. We don't have to, you know, do all these public things. But it's the basic, basically the same process. You gotta let everybody know. You gotta gather up the assets. You gotta figure out what they're worth. Figure out who gets what. And do I can I can picture when you were talking about gathering up all the assets, and I can just picture this person like miserly hiding all these details and not telling people. And I, I don't know why I had this goofy cartoon go through my head, but yeah, it's <laughs> well, I can you, see that happening in some families, and it does. And we, um, it probably doesn't happen that often, but we see it a lot. We, we do see it a lot. And it's, it's, so sometimes it's the trustee, the trustee's job is big and it's a lot. And, you know, you did the trustee job for your parents, but you, were, you had your own job, you were working and you're doing that job. So a lot of times it's just that there's not enough hours in the day. And so the trustee kind of, I don't want to say drops the ball, but they, they just get busy and they don't do things as quickly as the other children wish they would. This is where it gets problematic is the other siblings are sitting there, you know, tapping their fingers, 
and going, I could be putting that new patio in my backyard right now. If I had that money, why, what's taking so long? So, um, that happens a lot, but there are also people who are, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) not nice people and they will, they get their hands on the money. They're going to play fast and loose with it. So, um, what people need to know is that beneficiaries, if you're a trust beneficiary, you do have rights. And one of the really important rights is you have a right to know what's going on. And if you're, let's say your sister is the trustee, (laughs) your sister's the trustee. And it's been, you know, a year since your mom died, you still don't have your money. You need to, you need to ask questions. You need to get in there and say, what's going on? When am I going to get my money? What are you doing? And you are entitled to be kept informed all the way along. You are entitled to a full accounting. In other words, the trustee produces on paper. This is what I started with. This is the money that came in. This is the money I had to spend. And this is what's left. You're entitled to that at least once a year, at least once a year. And, you know, after someone dies, most trusts, you can finish them up in a year. I'm not, not all. Sometimes it takes longer, but. um, (laughs) I said, we we did ours. I'm trying to think. I think we did ours. My mom. So what my mom, my sister and I were co-trustees and the beneficiaries. Okay. There weren't any other beneficiaries. So Pretty there's simple. a lot of this transparency that happened, but didn't happen the way you're discussing it. Probably because we were, I mean, we well, both had access to everything. So we didn't, right. we didn't formalize anything. And maybe we should have, because she and I don't agree on anything, but we, my mom died March 31st, 2020. We sold her house in July. And I think we, we definitely finished the estate before the end of 2021 or 2020, excuse me. So in less years. than a year. Yeah. 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 But it, most of the trustee um, responsibilities happened after my dad died, which was three years before mom. Right. Because that's when we had to put, that's when we had to get the trustee bank account and all that stuff that you discussed. And I'm trying to remember who asked for the uh, taxpayer ID, if that was the bank or us or, I don't remember. It's been a while, but we did a lot of what you're talking about. We didn't do the notification. So, but then there was no, when my dad died, my sister and I became the co trustees and I was mom's healthcare power of attorney. And then, so there wasn't really any beneficiaries to notify and we did, you know, the normal stuff. Right. So it's just, it's kind of interesting. It's like we, we mostly did it right. And that's why I wanted to chat with you about this because, you know, there could be that one family member that just got to, you know, yeah. hold your feet to the fire because you didn't do everything 110% perfectly and they just give you hell. And if we can avoid, you know, it's hard enough to deal with all of this paperwork after somebody's died. It's like my dad died. And we had to deal with my mother. And it was like, well, it was just like, poof, that was worse. Mm-hmm. After mom died, it was, it was also right at the height of the pandemic. So it was like, there wasn't a lot we could do. So it right. just it right. felt very different. Mm -hmm. Well, you, so your situation is a a common one where the trustee and the beneficiaries, they, they get along, they trust each other. They can work well enough together that there's, there aren't going to be really any problems. And you can do that. You can work pretty quickly. You, you can skip some of these steps and that's, that is fine. And I, I would say in most families, that's how it goes. But when you have a, okay. And here's another thing that's unusual really about your family is that you had co-trustees and you still get along and you <laughs> work together really well. Cause sometimes that can be difficult. Um, I when think we parents- actually divided the tasks because we don't get along. We, we managed <sighs> like, you know, we're mm-hmm. adults and we can be mature and we managed, but. 
Like I said, we don't agree on anything. Literally, yeah. we never have. My sister's almost 51 and we've never agreed on anything. So, well, but you, you know, found but, a way, you have found a way to make it work. And that's yeah, thank, the important yeah. thing. That's the important thing. A lot of times siblings who don't really get along, they, they, they won't let go of whatever it is that stands in the way of making it work. And we see that a lot. There's a lot of childhood, um, you know, resentment that gets played out as adults. And that's unfortunate. And, and people, you know, people don't trust each other. If you, you had this big brother who was always mean to you and now all of a sudden he's the trustee, you can't let go of that and you don't trust him. And that causes a lot of problems for people. Um, and having co-trustee, we had not too long ago, we had a family where three children, they're the only children, they're the only beneficiaries, and they are all three trustees. <laughs> and they just, they just couldn't, they just couldn't do it. They got to sort of like an impasse. And now they each have their own lawyer and they're, oh dear Lord, you know, <laughs> so it, it can get very messy, very messy. Um, and so you, you, I congratulate you, you and your sister. Yeah. You don't get along. You don't see eye to eye, but you worked it out. You set that aside to get the job done. It was, I think we were focusing on what was, what mom needed. What? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that made it. And then afterwards, it's like, we just want to live our lives and go our separate ways. And go your separate get this. ways. Because I was, you know, she died right at the start of the pandemic and nobody really knew what the real estate market was going to do. And, you know, it was like, do we sell it now or do we wait? And it was like, and we had renters in there and I knew that the rental market was really difficult. And there was a part of me that was, and I kind of wish we did, but, you know. I didn't have a crystal ball that was telling me what would 2021 would look like. I I would have liked to have kept the house a little while. And I, you know, we could have split have the rent. made a little more money. Yeah. Uh, oh, we would have made a lot more money, but that's yeah. okay. You know, we had, would have had to deal with each other. So it's like, <laughs> get out. <laughs> right. I, we, I'm sure we would have managed, but, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things. I think we just... We had our own interests in heart. Like we need to do what's best for mom. And then after mom was gone, it was like, I need to take care of me and get this stuff done. And just be done with it. And part of it too, is just like, I didn't, I didn't want to deal with having to, to maintain mom's house. I mean, the renters were great, but it was just like, it was like that chapter's over. And I, yeah. and that felt like a, al not an albatross in a negative way, but it was just like, it was like the last big thing. And, you know, with real estate, you have never know. And we, we could have waited a year and lost money because it was a 50 year old house and it did need a little TLC. We I TLC it as much as I could for the the rental market three years earlier. You know, but how much money do you put into a house you're going to rent? So, you know, sure, these the, these are the <laughs> these are all the things yeah. that we we had to deal with. But, yeah, no, I've I've told people that I'm amazed at how for most of those three years that from my when my dad died to when mom died that she and I, you know, we, we handle things pretty well. I, I don't know why we couldn't have kept going, but families. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, we're humans. That's why. Well, yeah. and you, you bring up a good point when you talk about, you didn't know you didn't have a crystal ball. Should we sell the real estate? Should we sit on it? Should we wait for the, see what the market does? That's an important point for trustees to hear is when you're in a situation like that, you've got assets that are worth something, but could be worth something different depending on what happens in the world. You got to, you got to look at that very seriously. And I would say, talk to your beneficiaries. You know, you say, okay, we've got this property if we um, sell it now, we could probably get this much. If we wait a year, maybe it'll go up in value. What do you think? And you don't want to you don't want to be taking a position that's contrary to what all the beneficiaries think, and then you're shooting yourself in the foot. So 
ideally you're going to get everybody in writing to say, yes, we're going to sit on this property. Let's hold it for at least a year and see, see if the market values will go up. You know, that, that is a prudent thing to do if you can, if you can, you know, ultimately it's the trustee's decision and responsibility. (laughs) So you don't, ideally you get everybody to agree yet we think you're doing the right thing. And there's an official process for doing that too. It's called a notice of proposed action. The trustee kind of sends out a letter saying, this is what I plan to do. If you object, let me know. Otherwise I'm going to go ahead and do it. And that way the trustee's kind of covering their butt. You know, I gave you a chance to object and you didn't. So now you can't complain that that decision of mine didn't work out the way you wanted it to. We didn't sell it in 2021. We, we, we sold it immediately and we could have made more money if we'd waited, but oh well. But you, the, yeah, then there's no way to know. And that's a, the, exactly the kind of situation where this could go either way. Um, I'm, I encourage you to get input from your beneficiaries in that kind of a situation. And we're in that situation. <sighs> It seems like all the time, you know, it could be the stock market, you know, you could have a really nice investment portfolio and a week from now it's down 20%. Oh, how are you going to feel about that? (laughs) You know, are your beneficiaries going to say, why didn't you go to cash? Why didn't you liquidate? You know, so you got to think about those things. And, um, and I'm sure there are a lot of trustees in the last month or two, thanks to Mr. Putin, who are are thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this portfolio is down 10% from a week ago. What am I going to say to my beneficiaries? It's not their fault. Mm -mm. It's watching the stock market with the whole Russia, Ukraine thing has been interesting because we have an investment accounts and my husband just loves to look at it every day. And I kept telling him this, the, the, (laughs) yeah, the, the, the whole invasion potential, is freaking out the stock market. And then I get like a push notification, like we're stock market day. And I don't know, 40 years or some atrocious number. And, you know, he looked at it and he was just like ill for a minute. It wiped him and, out. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, and it's like, and I told him like, just relax, it'll come back. It's not like we need the money tomorrow. Cause if we did, we'd be in big trouble. I mean, it didn't wipe out the account, but it went down, you know, two yeah, or $3,000. Yeah. You know, that's, 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 a, that's real you know, money. Yeah, yeah. That's real money. <laughs> Yeah, it's a nice vacation or, you know, most of a mortgage payment, I think. I don't know. It was it was it, there was like three days where it was really bad. And then I guess what was going on with the world leaders? I don't know. I don't understand why the stock market does it what it does. So I don't watch that off of just like as long as it doesn't go to zero, I'm fine. <laughs> this yeah. is not Vegas. <laughs> Right. But and that, but I but, could see how somebody would be like, you know, they knew this was going to happen. Why didn't you liquidate or why we need to hold on to it so it comes back. I mean, everybody's got an opinion. Right. And that's <laughs> that comes into the point I made earlier, which is this isn't your money. Trustee, this is the money of all of the beneficiaries. So you might feel comfortable with a certain amount of risk. But do they and you have to take that into account. You can't just go off on your own and be a maverick and um, take a lot of risk. So we also might feel like I'm the oldest of the two of us. I'm four and a half years older than my sister. And so there's a lot of times that I, I made decisions. Like I didn't always tell her when, you know, Oh, I got to take mom to the doctor. We think she's got a UTI because she had enough stuff on her plate. And it's like, I, I didn't, my, the thought process was, I don't want to stress her out about something I'm handling. Mm-hmm. And then when I, after mom dies and I look back and I'm like, that probably looked like I was keeping secret. So you might in your mind have, you know, like I'm trying to have the best interest yeah, of everybody. You had, the, you had the best of intentions. Yeah. But it could be interpreted absolutely yeah. badly. And I, I get that. And I'm like, I probably shouldn't have done that, but oh, well, too late. And you know, it's, they might have a different opinion. They will have a different opinion because their life circumstances are different. And right. you should just ask anyway, even though it's going to annoy the crap out of you. <laughs> well, you kind of have to, you have to weigh it. You know, is this a small enough thing that even if she disagrees with my 
choice, it's not going to be a big deal. Or is it kind of big enough? I probably should give her a heads up. So it's, it's a balance. It's a balance. Um, but when you are a trustee, you have what we call a fiduciary duty to put the interests of the beneficiaries ahead of your own. Even if you are a beneficiary, you have to think about everybody and do what's right for everybody. So that's a, I would say most, most of our clients get that right away. They, but once in a while we have a client that we have to keep reminding them, no, you know, (laughs) this is not your money. You have to, (laughs) you have to do the right thing. And um, you have to let everybody know what you're doing. You don't get to just go off and do things. So, um, so the, the, the final piece, you know, after you've paid all the bills, paid all the taxes, and now you have what's left, maybe it's, you know, a big bank account or a bank account and an investment account, you have to produce an accounting to your beneficiaries. Now, when you are the trustee and the the sole beneficiary, like your sister, you and your sister, you're the trustees and the beneficiaries. You don't have to produce an accounting to each other. You're, you're living the accounting, you know, what happened, but if there's anybody else besides you, you got to share all this information with them. You, you know, in writing, you say, this is where we started. This is what came in. This is what went out. And now here's what's left and here's what your share of what's left is going to be. And the beneficiaries, if they don't like your accounting. So one thing, you know, trustees get paid. Now, you and your sister, you, you're you not going to pay yourselves to be the trustee because that's coming right out of your inheritance. It doesn't make it's, any sense. No. But if you're the one, let's say you have four siblings, you're the only trustee, you're doing all the work you are entitled to get paid for that work. So that's part of your accounting. You're going to tell the beneficiaries, here's what's left. And I'm taking this much of it for my fee as the trustee. And, you know, the beneficiaries are entitled to know that and they can also object to that. And that's what the probate court is for. They can, Lord, no. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you want to be reasonable you're, that's what you're entitled to is reasonable compensation. That's the attorney's favorite word in the world. Reasonable. <laughs> you know, Cause Which it has covers not, not a very specific definition right. either. It is covers there, a lot. <laughs> so you could set your own fee. I thought yeah. there was like a, a chart. <laughs> no, no. The trustee sets their own fee and you know, there are, you can get guidance from your attorney about what generally is considered reasonable in your situation in your community. Um, you know, the big bank trust departments, they will serve as a trustee. Um, and they'll usually charge like uh, something like 1%, 1.25% of the value of the trust as their fee. It depends. So, you know, that's one way of looking at it. Most family member trustees, um, they don't have the same knowledge and ability that a bank trustee would have. So they probably shouldn't charge that much. Um, Part of the thing about having a professional trustee like a bank is you're not paying a lot of lawyer's fees. You know, when, when we are working as the attorney for a family member trustee, they need us a lot. They need a lot of help from us because they don't know what they're doing. And that's normal. That's to be expected. But a professional trustee, they know what they're doing. They hardly, they hardly use us at all. They'll, they'll pop in and out and say, I need you to do this. And they actually tell us what to do. (laughs) (laughs) I need you to do this because this is a legal document. And then they go away and they, do, you know, so family member trustees, you can't, you probably can't charge that full, you know, 1% or 1.2% because you probably aren't worth it. It's a lot of money. If you've got like my dad, my parents trust had investment accounts and the proceeds from the house. And it was, you know, it it wasn't a chump change. 
And one percent is, uh, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to pay my sister one (laughs) percent. No, you wouldn't. And so and the other thing about the trustee getting paid to do their work is that's income. That's ordinary income. You have to pay taxes on it. So if you can, instead of charging a fee, you get a bigger inheritance. Maybe that's worth it. You know, you don't want to because inheritances are not income. You don't declare them. Um, That is true. You don't pay taxes. Do you find that most of your family trustees don't don't charge the the trust for their time? I would say most, but um, it's it's very common for a trustee to charge something. You know, if they're it, it nobody else knows how much work it is. And and uh, what I will say this this is it's very common that in the beginning they'll say, "Oh, I'm not going to charge." I'm not going to charge. It's my, you know, it's my sister, my sister and brother. I'm not going to charge them. And I say, okay, that's fine. But do me a favor. Just keep track of your hours anyway. And when we get to the end, let's look at that. (laughs) And you then decide, are you going to charge? Are you not going to charge? And if you get to the end and you put 500 hours into this work, maybe you're going to feel okay about charging a little bit. That's you know, wouldn't you like to have 500 extra hours in a year? I yeah. would. I know yeah. exactly what I would do with it. I would sleep. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so it's a lot of work is what I'm saying that people don't appreciate until you actually have to do it, how much work it is. Not every case. Some are very simple. You've got mom. She had a house and a bank account. One child. That's pretty simple. But, you know, every little piece of complexity that gets thrown in there, it's work for the trustee and and they should get paid if they want to. So I was mostly curious. I'm just always amazed. You know, I'm getting to that stage of life where, you know, a lot of my friends are becoming trustees for the various family members who have passed. And some of them, it's like, your mom died like a year and a half before my mom. Why are you still dealing with this? And it's just like, I I know my sister and I, we got lucky. It was, it was, it was fairly easy, which is the other reason I wanted to talk to you. Cause I'm like, I know other people put in tons of time and it's stressful and it's not fun. And I'm like, well, okay. I don't really know why it's such a big deal, but cause that was not my experience. Yeah. And I think well, a lot of it was because my dad had it all organized. Everything was in the mm-hmm. trust. Mm-hmm. We knew people who could say, yes, you need to do these things. And we did most of the bulk of the work before mom died. So like, I don't know. It just, right. it all fell into, like my mom always said, everything happens for a reason. So mm-hmm. apparently it was easy because if it had gotten complicated and, and sticky, probably wouldn't have been as smooth with the two of us just saying. <laughs> right. And yeah, and every case is different. So sometimes the trustee inherits a mess. Not like what you had when your mom died, things had already been really well organized. Everything was set up. We have trustees who um they have to they have to like go to the mail every day to figure out even what the bank accounts are. They don't, they don't even know. Did my mom have a bank account at mechanics? I don't know. I won't know until the statement arrives. So, you know, you're, you were miles ahead of those people. They're scrambling just to figure out even what the assets are. And some assets are much more complicated than others. You know, if you have to sell multiple pieces of real estate, that's a lot of work. You know, you, you just not too long ago sold your house um, down here before you moved up into the, the mountains, you know how much work that is. That's, and, and, uh, if you got to do that two or three times in a year, because you've got three properties to sell, that's a lot of work too. So that is true. Yeah. Every case is, is different. And, and I know people think they can Google for answers or figure stuff out, but you know what? There is a lot of benefit to asking a professional like, you know, right now 
We all know the real estate market is insane. My husband's been in real estate 18 years this summer, which is hard to imagine. And because he was in banking for 20 before that. So it's just like, holy oh. Toledo, how old are we? <laughs> you don't want to say those numbers together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's OK. Like I, I tell people, my paternal grandmother lived to be 103. So I am solidly middle aged. That's cool. You know, <laughs> and it's, I tell well, people, you got 45 more years put up with me. But there's like we he is selling our friend's home, which was two doors down from the one we sold. And they've got it in their head that they got to rent these storage units and they got to move all this stuff out. And my husband's like, put it in the garage. But we wanted the garage to like put it in the garage. And he's had this stupid argument about where to put their excess stuff. And he said, if this was a sell or a buyer's market, yeah, I would tell you to make sure the garage looked nice. He's like, I already got people that watch your house. Don't worry about it. Put the crap in the yeah. garage. They're going to buy know, it. They're going to buy yeah, it with the you know, garage full so, of stuff. Yeah. Pete, you yeah. know, you are experienced in what you do. He's experienced in real estate. You know, I have my experiences in photography and podcasting. So don't, don't cheat yourself, you know, by not talking to professionals. Because I know that is having known my dad's financial planner, my dad's attorney, and because they were family friends and all that made the whole process a lot easier too. Cause they'd ba basically say, now you did such and such, right? Oh no, I didn't. Oh, you better do. That. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it was just like a conversation like we're having. It was easy. And like yeah. I said, thankfully it was easy so that my sister and I could deal with each other. <laughs> well, and we, so one of the things that we do to make it easy for people is we, we offer this service that we call a trust roadmap. And so people send, you know, the person who's now become the trustee, like you, when your mom died, you can't, you're the trustee. You send us the trust, you send us the will. We have a little worksheet that we ask you to gather some information. You send all that to us. We, we go through it, we analyze it, and then we meet with you and we have we have created for you what we call a trust roadmap. And it's got all the steps that you've got to take in this particular situation based on what you've told us. And so you can so easily get that, you know, push in the right direction so that you're not going to miss any steps. You're not going to do anything wrong by just doing just that initial piece. And, and we offer that to, um, you know, the wide world, we charge very reasonably $350, but for your listeners, if somebody calls my office and says, Oh, I heard about this on the fading memories podcast, we'll do it complimentary just for your listeners. But even if you, you know, it's so worth $350. It's oh, a, totally. It's a bargain because it gets you, you know, this is step one, to 29, everything that's got to happen. You probably need help with some of those steps, but at least, you know, you, you know, I, I think it's worth $350 for that peace of mind. Like, okay, I know I'm heading in the right direction. Well, that sounds perfect for people like me that, you know, can do a lot of this stuff. It's like, right. tell me what I need to do and I will do it. And you're right. for $350, which these days is not really seriously not that much. Yeah, money. I know that's like Safeway trip. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for real. Oh, there's two of us. I don't want to tell you my husband goes to the grocery store way too often. We eat well. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but well, you know, eating is about all we can do right now. So <laughs> and work it out on the Peloton after you're done eating all that stuff. That's right. But yeah, that's you know, right. it's if you could I'm thinking you could take that document, that roadmap to the other trustee or the other beneficiaries or whoever else is going to poke their nose into the business because, you know, that's what happens. You get yeah. to deal with that every day, I'm sure, and say, this is what we need to do, or this is what I have to do. Or, you yeah. know, it's 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 kind of not me saying, oh, hey, sis, this is what has to happen. And she's like, oh, really? You know, let me investigate that yeah. for myself. Somebody else is saying, here's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And then if you're smart, you don't miss anything and you're not calling Kirsten in the, you know, first thing in the morning in tears because life has blown up on you and you got beneficiaries screaming at you and the government right. is after you. <laughs> that just sounds so unpleasant. Yeah, that's it. That is a really good point. I mean, it's not only um, a 
guide for the trustee. It's also sort of, um, you know, a visual that the trustee can share with the other beneficiaries to say, look at all the items on this list. This is not happening in three months. You just need to be prepared. I've got all this to do and it's going to take a while. So, you know, it's the trustee can use it in multiple ways. Yes. <laughs> Might be worth 350 bucks just to keep people off your back. Yeah. Yeah. They don't buy, <laughs> it'll buy you at least six months and they'll be quiet and they'll leave you alone so you can get your job done. <laughs> Yeah, that is a real, I hadn't thought about that. That's a good point. <laughs> well, good point. my mom always said I came at things from the negative angle, but I don't think that's negative. It's just, it's just life. It's realistic. It's, yeah, yeah, that's what I always it's said. I'm like, I'm not negative. I'm realistic. <laughs> yeah, things go sideways from time to time. They just do for a variety of reasons. Sometimes nobody's being bad. It's just we all see things differently. Anytime you have two people, you have two different points of view. So that is very true. Boy, do I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've been married for a while, you certainly know that. Yeah. I do that too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. So did we cover everything that trustees and beneficiaries need to know before we wrap it up? At a, at a certain level. Yeah. I think we covered the as, as much the, as we can in under an hour. Exactly. We we would lose a lot of listeners if we covered everything. It would be that is too true. boring, too boring. But um, the, Might lose the me too. Yeah, I think the important takeaway is, you know, there's a lot there that you you aren't going to know unless you ask somebody. So ask somebody, and and it's okay to get some help, and um, it's also okay to tell your siblings to settle down for a little bit, <laughs> back off. <laughs> So, well, that I hope is that was it was excellent. See, and I knew there was things that I didn't know, and that's why I wanted to talk to you. And good. this was wonderful. Good. So, thank well, you so much, and thank you for that generous offer. I'm going to make sure everybody knows about it. Hopefully, they don't inundate you. But I know mm -hmm. my listeners are not quite at that point yet. But when they get there, <laughs> now they have a tool. They've they've heard this. They could contact you. Or their own attorney and say, hey, I need this. Get right. to get in. Right. So you can, you know, you can contact us on uh, our website. You can see absolutetrustcouncil.com. Very easy to find. Or you can Google my name, Kirsten Howe, and um, and you'll find us. And and that, you know, we like I said, we have a, a ton of resources on our website. And if you find something there that's useful to you, please, you know, go ahead. Take it. Download it. Download it. Yep. It up, Definitely a lot. Need. There was a lot of stuff. It was hard to choose which topic we were going to talk about today. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Might have to have you back. I would love to come back. Well, I would thank be honored. you so much. Thanks for having me. I had a good time. It was you're you're always fun to talk to. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.